Welcome everyone to worship today. Today we consider the question, why did you doubt? And we see how faith rooted in Christ, always with Christ at the center, overcomes doubt. Let's begin our worship with our opening hymn. It's hymn 422. We sing verses 1, 2, and 4. May the Lord Jesus bless worship today. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful. <clears throat> you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Your first lesson is taken from the book of James, chapter 1, those selected verses 2 through 8 and verse 12. He talks about prayer, but he also talks about faith and confidence that we approach God and we do with the faith that is rooted in Christ, the faith that does not doubt then but clings to Christ and his promises. And so we can offer prayers to God that are our bold prayers made with that foundation of Jesus as our Savior. And through that we are blessed. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. 
because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. This is the word of God. And we continue with the children's devotion. We have heard a couple of important words, and we're going to hear more about them during the service this evening. One of them is faith, and one of them is doubt. Now, faith, I got an idea you've probably heard that, certainly if you've been here in church before and heard a few other sermons and lessons and readings from the uh, scriptures, you've heard about the word faith. Faith is... Well, faith is when you really believe in something strongly. You just know that it's so. Like, uh, you have faith that the Packers are going to win the Super Bowl. Well, maybe that should be more in the doubt category, but that's another discussion. So doubt is the other word we heard about. Doubt is when somebody tells you something or you hear something and you think, I'm not so sure about that. But instead of trying to just explain the words. Let's see, with Pastor Martin's help, if we can demonstrate that. Now, if I were to tell you that I could get this balloon to fly around the entire world, to fly completely around the world, do you think that would fall in the, yeah, the faith side or maybe the doubt side? Well, with Pastor Martin's help, uh, maybe we can prove the point to see if we can get this balloon to fly around the entire world. <laughs> All right, it looks good. It kind of looks like Atlas there holding up the world. Okay, so here we go. All the way around the world. Okay, that's not exactly what you expected. But that's another, maybe that's another lesson we should learn about that. When we hear something or maybe when we want something really badly, want something really badly, maybe, maybe have even prayed about it, but it just doesn't seem to happen. It just doesn't, we kind of think maybe God isn't listening. So it's maybe like this. You've thought about the balloon going around the entire world instead of going around a small globe like that. But that sometimes happens. Sometimes what we wish for, what we even pray for sometimes, we think it doesn't quite turn out or we think maybe God isn't listening. But there is one important lesson that we should learn, that if something doesn't quite work out the way you want, if some plan you made or something you prayed about really hard kind of goes completely up in smoke, don't start doubting right away because if your plan didn't work out exactly the way you wanted, maybe God's got a whole other plan for you. Let's say a prayer about that. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for healing our doubt and strengthening our faith. Thank you for always be willing to listen to us. Amen. Let's stand for the reading of the gospel lesson. That's from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33, and will serve as the text for our sermon today. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, 
If it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We sing the next hymn, 415, verses 1 and 2. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, his grace and his peace to all of us to give us confidence and to still our souls. The lesson we look at today, as I mentioned before, is from the gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. So the question for today again is, why did you doubt? The questions that Jesus asks directly from the scriptures are always the best questions because they are piercing questions and they always find a way to get right to the heart of the matter. As we think of things tonight about doubt, doubt has always been the unfortunate companion of faith. Doubt has been with humanity since God created Adam and Eve. Doubt was right there in the beginning, wasn't it? The very first words recorded for us in Scripture from the devil in Genesis chapter 3 were when he was there with Adam and Eve at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he spoke these words to Adam and Eve. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The entire purpose of that question, right, was to create doubt and mistrust about God and that God was actually their loving, creating Father. And so doubt has always been that unfortunate companion of faith, but, as we'll see tonight, that faith will always overcome doubt when that faith 
is focused on Jesus. Did you notice how the text began tonight? It, it began with, a, it, a, with actually a real sense of urgency. Did you catch it in those words? Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. So, so why this sense of urgency that Jesus immediately, God, get in the boat, get in the boat now and go? Well, the crowd that Jesus was dismissing, it was when he fed the 5,000 men plus women and children. With that miracle of feeding them with the two small fish and the five loaves of barley bread, it's that very same day the miracle has taken place. The disciples have picked, has picked up the 12 basketfuls of leftovers. And sometime after that, the, the crowd decides, because the majority of the crowd was, was very impressed, word made it around. He's not getting this food from everywhere, anywhere other than him just willing it into existence. Well, an evil, devilish plan had hatched among the crowd. They wanted to kidnap Jesus. And they wanted to take him by force to Jerusalem because the Passover was going to be happening soon. And there at the Passover, they were going to make Jesus king whether he wanted it or not and whether the Romans wanted it or not. We're told in the Gospel of John, in John's account of the feeding of the 5,000 and then the walking on water after it, in John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. That crowd was not interested in Jesus as the savior from sin. They wanted a savior who would be a king who would overthrow the Romans. And Jesus knew that his disciples would be very susceptible to that temptation, to seeing Jesus as a worldly kind of king instead of a spiritually kind of king. And so Jesus, he needed to get those guys out of here. Get on the boat and go. And so they, they headed back. They were on one side of the lake. They headed all the way back to the other for the feeding of the 5,000. And now they're going back to the place where they started. I want to take a break for a second, just a little tangent, and talk about prayer for a moment. Because before we get into the miracle of the walking on water, the, the text talks about Jesus praying. It appears that Jesus had hours. Because he went to the disciples during the fourth watch of the night, and that was sometime between, the fourth watch was always 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So sometime between that three-hour period, he walked out on the lake by his disciples. So there's probably a matter of hours where Jesus, he dismissed the crowd and dealt with the crowd, got his disciples out of there, and then he goes and prays. With all the things that he had going on, with it being late at night, and all that he had done in that day before already, he took time, hours probably, to pray. Just that alone, it's a mini yet powerful little sermon for us on the importance of prayer and carving out time for prayer. Because prayer, it can be one of those things, those gifts from God, that we, we just neglect, or even worse, just kind of forget about and don't use. Where we're sometimes more likely to open up the apps on our phone and just absorb ourselves for an hour, maybe hours, in the lives of people that we know, or even people that we don't know, and yet we have a hard time sometimes carving out time, 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour, to spend time with Jesus, to spend time with our Father, to bring our worries and concerns to him, to let him, as we think of him and his promises, to, to calm and to still our hearts and to drive away our doubt. So it's just an encouragement. Make use. Take time. Jesus took time to pray, sometimes for hours and hours on end. Find time. Take time to pray. All right, back to the miracle. All right, let's tackle the, the showdown now between doubt and between faith. So it is the third watch of the night, or the fourth watch of the night, and the disciples had been at this rowing for a long time. And they must have just been physically and mental, the, the fatigue and the exhaustion that they must have been facing. And they see this figure out on the lake, and, and it's getting closer, and they're terrified because what is on the lake, and they think it's a ghost. And, and Jesus takes care of that as it gets closer. There's a dialogue that takes place. He calms them down with his words. He spoke to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And those words to calm his disciples, they worked. They went from that kind of superstitious doubt of what, what, what's going on out here to having a 
solid faith in Jesus. And Peter actually shows that. In his response to Jesus, when he says, if it is you, it doesn't sound like that in our English. It doesn't sound like he's saying that in faith. Because when we think that, when we hear that kind of a phrase, if it is you, it's almost to us and how we use that phrase, it's like he's hedging his bet, right? Well, if it really is you, then tell me to come out here and then I'll know it's really you. But that's not how, that's how it comes across in the English. But in the Greek, that's actually, it's a term of certainty. It's more along the lines of Peter saying, if it is you, and we truly indeed know it's you because you are on the water and you're standing right in front of us and you've said that it's you, then just say the word and I know that I will be able to come out on that water with you. And so this was a moment of great and strong faith by Peter. Faith here with Peter, it's riding high. It's Jesus, and Jesus is doing this, and if he commands me to do it, I know that I will be able to do it too. And so he gets out on that water, and he's walking, and faith is riding high. And all of a sudden, the gust of wind that had been buffeting the boat, maybe some of the spray of the waves, hits him, and he begins to sink. Let's pause there for a moment. There's a number of things that can come to mind with this. First, what are the waves? What is the wind in your life? Is it the stress about going back to school? I know a lot of our our school families, whether it's parochial or public school families, teachers, leaders, deal with that stress and with those questions. What's the school year going to be like? A lot of wind and waves involved with that. It can be the mass situation. It can be just dealing with, with the COVID fatigue in general. What's going on in this crazy world of ours? It can be getting a doctor bill and then getting a dentist bill and getting, getting a car bill right on top of that and thinking, oh my goodness, where am I going to get the money for this? The, the wind and the waves, it can come in so many different ways in your lives. And it's just, we just have to know, you and I have to be aware of that, that whenever the wind and waves are there, and they'll always be there in some way or shape or form, that the devil is always going to try to use those to twist them against us, to turn them against your faith, to try to get you to doubt Jesus. And so in our lives as Christians, we need to find a way when every day we're going to be dealing with some kind of wind and some kind of waves so that we don't let those things distract our focus from Jesus. A second thing with this doubt, that did you notice how quickly one can go from faith to doubt, from faith to doubt? It's almost like when kids play red light, green light. You know, first red light, you turn around quick, green light. And as one of the kids are further back in the gymnasium or wherever, you don't turn around as quick, but then as they sense them getting closer, it's red light, green light, red light, green light, red light, green light. In our lives, it can kind of seem like that sometimes with our faith and doubt, can it? Faith, doubt, faith, doubt, faith, doubt, where we find ourselves, and it's an infuriating thing, isn't it? Where faith can be riding high, and then for some reason, it might, maybe almost seemingly nothing, we lose sight of Jesus, and the doubt comes in, and the anxiety comes in, and it's faith, doubt, faith, doubt, faith, doubt. It's part of that battle and part of that struggle that we live as Christians. And sometimes we can wonder, well, do do I even have faith at all if I'm like this? The answer is yes, because you wouldn't care and you wouldn't ask yourself that question if you didn't have faith in Jesus. Another frustrating thing can be when you and I have that doubt and we can see that, that doubt creating problems like uncertainty. Who's in charge of this world? Is God here? Does God really care? Maybe I I haven't been good enough, or maybe God's getting me back because it seems like he's letting things get a little bit windier in my life and the, the, the waves are getting pretty choppy. Doubt creates negativity. It, it prevents us from seeing any positive possibilities to anything. It, it robs us of that potential. It can create a a woe-is-me type attitude inside of us. It can make it so that we just kind of live just like almost like we're waiting for the sky to fall or the hammer to just come down because I just know something's going to happen bad. What do you do then? 
What do you do when, when doubt is rearing its ugly head and you're trying to wrestle with that doubt and you're trying to get it out of your life? Listening to Jesus' question is a great place to start. Listen to his question every single time in your life when you're tempted to face doubt. Why did you doubt? And as you ponder that question and think about that question, why did you doubt? It's a question that Jesus answered or asked that has no answer, right? There is no reasonable answer to that question. Not when you know that you have Jesus with you. And so it's, it's a brilliant question because it gets us to, to, to repent of the, the, the yuckiness and the lack of trust and, and the, the, the willingness to, that we're too easy to doubt at times. But it is at the same time this gentle and reminder and encouragement. Why did you doubt? I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm your Savior. I'm with you all the time. I care about you. I love you. That, that question, it, it gets the focus back on Jesus right where that focus and that faith needs to be. And as you and I are going through that struggle and living that struggle in our lives, what does Jesus do? We have Peter. He was hurting. Lord, save me. And there Jesus is right away, the hand down, right there to grab Peter, to keep him from drowning. Picks him up, keeps him safe. And Jesus does that to you. He loves you so much. As you come to him hurting, as you come to him even praying, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. He's right there to grab you by the hand, hold you close to him, still your soul, encourage you of his love and his faithfulness and his care for you. That's what we do as Christians when we doubt. We, we look to Jesus and let him lift us up and to rescue us. In this battle, so in this battle, this struggle that you and I have every day between faith and, and doubt and to hold on to Christ, Jesus gives you a powerful tool. At the end of the text, did you catch it? It's what we're doing right now. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Worship is a great, it's, a, it's an awesome tool that God has given to us. At worship, you're able to come here and you're able to sing your hymns of praise. We're able to pray. We're able to express our appreciation to Jesus. We can bring our sins as we confess our sins. We can hear the absolution. And most importantly, Jesus comes to you. He comes to you through word, through sacrament, to take that faith that he so graciously put inside of your heart and to strengthen that faith. To make it so that when those doubts come, that faith will overcome them. It'll happen every time. Every time you look in faith to Christ, because your faith is rooted in Christ, Jesus will make it so that faith overcomes doubt. It's a battle. Every day it's a battle. And it will always be that way. There will always be wind. There will always be waves. There will always be that battle and that struggle that goes on between faith and doubt. But you and I never need to spare. Just ask yourself that question that Jesus, why do you doubt? And let your mind turn right back to Jesus. Yeah, that's right. I, this is hard and this is difficult, but Jesus is with me. My Savior who loves me is right here. He loves me. He forgives me. He has made me his own. And when that faith, when that focuses on Jesus, then it will always happen, every time, that faith will overcome doubt. Amen. Let's make a confession of our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord God, we praise you for the glorious gospel of your grace. 
You sent your Son to die for our sins and rise again on the third day, that we through him might be saved. Grant that we may ever repent of our sinfulness, turn to you for forgiveness, and be cleansed of all iniquity. Keep our hearts focused on you in faith and drive away all doubt in our lives. Bestow the Holy Spirit upon your church, that we may go forth into all the world, bearing your precious gospel and preaching Jesus Christ among all nations for the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life. Pour out your blessings on our homes. Lead all parents to train up their children to know, love, and fear you, that all may live together in peace, kindness, and understanding. Hear the prayers of the afflicted, the sorrowful, and those who mourn, the needy and the homeless, the wounded and all in pain, the anxious and the despairing, and lead them by your mercy out of all their adversities. We ask things, these things in Jesus' name and also pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And receive with believing hearts the blessing of your Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And we close with the final hymn. Welcome again to everyone. Wonderful to be able to worship with you. May that word of Jesus drive out our doubt and replace it with that faith and trust in him. Uh, we go in confidence and we go in grace and peace of our Savior. Have a good rest of your week. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. In 2020, we celebrate 100 years of Wells Campus Ministry. It's an effort that's only increased in importance as universities have grown larger and more secular, making it easy for even Wells students to drift away from the faith. Campus Ministries offer a link to stay connected at a key point in the lives of our young people. We are truly blessed to have so many people here today to enjoy each other's company, to enjoy this food that you've placed before us. But most of all... This is International Night at the Wells Campus Ministry at the University of Wisconsin. The wide-ranging cuisine attracts students from many different backgrounds. We have a lot of students from China. We've got students from Korea and Japan and Brazil. They can share in a meal, and then we also get to help them to practice their English, and we get to learn more about their culture as well. Some singing, we have some uh, reading, we have some... Uh... This is our Synod's oldest and largest campus ministry, with a full schedule of events like Bible studies, outreach classes in English as a second language, and worship. I want to talk about your family a little bit. I want to talk about God's family. 
It's truly amazing that 100 years ago, somebody thought, you know, there's a university here in Madison. We should connect students with each other and with the Word of God. It's that sense of community to say we're going to bring Christians together, uh, bring people to hear God's Word during a very difficult time of life. And that's what the Lord has allowed to continue here in Madison for almost 100 years now. Campus ministries don't have to be large to be effective. Consider the example of Pastor Brian Robel of Zion Lutheran in Gainesville. Today, he's on campus at the University of Florida. Like every Tuesday during the school year, he's leading a Bible study at the college coffee shop. While the setting is informal, the value of gatherings like this is enormous, offering a lifeline to young people who are away from their home church for the very first time. Looking at the opportunity to, to, to do this Bible study has been great. That's why I find it very important to, you know, to, to meet like this. Because if your faith, if you're not, you know, taking the time to kind of build it, it's going to wither. I think having other people around knowing that they're going through the same things that I'm going through is definitely a big thing and that I'm not alone. College students often have lots of challenges in life and in their faith. That's why it's especially important we serve them in these critical years. They come with challenging questions at times too, which makes me better as a pastor, makes our congregation better because it causes us to dig into the word and, and ask questions um, going to the proper source. We cover just such depth of um, like really diving into it and trying to understand like some of the really difficult things about salvation and scripture and and I like that side of it. Those challenges against my faith have actually grown my faith, have allowed me to um, be even more confident in the salvation I have through Christ. Weekly informal Bible studies are just one of many ways churches can connect to students through campus ministry. Maintaining my faith through college wasn't going to be something that I could do alone. It was something that I was going to need help with, it was something that I was going to need encouragement with, and it's just more fun when you're doing it with people. To help congregations get started, Wells is now offering a campus ministry toolkit with ideas and templates to help churches take the first steps in campus ministry. In addition to the new toolkit, the Wells Campus Ministry Committee offers a range of valuable materials to help congregations get started. Even if you don't have a college nearby, there's no shortage of ways you can participate to bring Christ Jesus to students on campuses. Visit wells.net for ideas and resources.